Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your ever more disheveled than ever goblin host, Daniel Green, because I do not know if I can go to the barber right now. Don't think that's allowed. And today we have quite the amazing spectrum of fantasy news to get to. But before we get into that, I would like to go ahead and just recommend you check out my interview with author Nicholas Ames. I released it yesterday. It was a ton of fun talking to creator of Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose. He had quite a bit to say about nerd culture, the music that inspired him, Rush. It was just... Ah, great, fantastic. I, of course, have it linked right down there. Now, going ahead and just jumping on into that hardcore fantasy news, we have a new illustrated edition of A Storm of Swords being released November of 2020. We already had some sneak peek art provided for us. It looks like this, and I think looks quite awesome. This is from artist Gary Giani, who is also involved with the illustrated edition of Game of Thrones, and I think he did an incredible job. That looks fantastic to me, and ah, I'm really tempted to get this. I only have like a couple illustrated editions of fantasy books right now and this one all of these song of ice and fire books are really tempting i don't know about you guys but like i want it i'm not a huge fan of the cover that red and purple i guess looks rather regal but it's not super special i don't know i guess i'm more curious about the art inside now rather than having the cover displayed on my shelf and in probably the last time we're going to cover this series until the next book is released news we finally got the u.s cover reveal for the third book in the poppy war the burning god i was expecting a pretty different one from the uk version but what they did was they changed the color from orange to purple at first i wondered why they did this and then I realized I, I definitely had a compulsion to buy both. So then I realized, yeah, it works. I don't know, just a small color scheme change. And I'm like, I must have them. Which do you prefer? Do you like the orange, more fiery look? Or do you like the purple, more regal look to this? Let me know in the comments down below. It's, it's curious to say the least. I guess their market research just showed Americans like purple. I mean, I like purple. You're not necessarily wrong. Exhibit A. And I'm catching this kind of late in the day, so sorry for the uh, dress down approach for this, but there's also an amazing cause going on over at the r slash fantasy subreddit. It has 62 authors, 144 books, all for 99 cents with 50% of proceeds going to COVID-19 relief. These people are certified badasses for doing this. Go ahead and check out that link to look at these books and go ahead and purchase some and help a good cause. The r slash fantasy subreddit, you guys are just monsters in, in, a, in a good way, and I love you. And in not necessarily hardcore fantasy news, but related to the genre roundabout ways news and something I just wanted to cover, apparently book sales are spiking during these isolated times, which I think a lot of us could have called. I mean, we all have a little bit more time on our hands, do we not? Probably burn through those TBRs. But specifically, fiction and notable classics are what apparently are spiking the most significant amounts. And that's interesting specifically to me. I like that people are taking this time to, one, burn through that fiction they've been looking forward to, but also, two, hitting those classics. Y'all reading some Dracula? Let me know. Iliad and the Odyssey? Hitting it up? Let me know what you're reading right down there in those comments. I'm, I'll be checking it out. I'll let you know what I'm reading in response. I do find it interesting that they're referring to it as bucket list reads. That's, I don't think what people are thinking when they're picking up these books. I, I'm not thinking, oh, I have to read this before I die. And for my lock and key fans out there, I bet you're really excited to hear that season two over at Netflix has officially been confirmed. Here we cut to a recreation of the fans' reactions. <laughs> Now, before we cut away from the hardcore fantasy news and more to the just fantasy and entertainment in general news, for those of you who've been paying attention on Twitter, you already know I have another interview coming down the pipes with Sarah Nakamura, Wheel of Time mega fan and consultant for the show based off the series. I'm really excited to get that to you, and leading up to it, I asked her, could I get a little sneak peek of just what is to come? Uh, specifically, could you show my fans what your reaction to seeing Trollocs the first time was? And here's what she had to say. People ask me all of the time what it was like for me the very first time I ever saw a Trolloc. And this is exactly how it went. Perfect. I can take one home. I can, I can take one home. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Now, this next piece of news is appealing to me in a very weird way, but let's just go ahead and jump into it. Horizon Zero Dawn is a very popular game, I think still exclusively to the PlayStation. I'll look that up and double check, and if it's not, I'm gonna get it and start playing it. But I personally haven't been able to complete the game because I don't own a PlayStation, but the franchise seems extremely successful at creating this 
a sci-fi primal world that hooked me just on premise alone. And I'll be able to dive into it deeper because a comic book is coming down the road to be released in July. It takes place in the franchise world after the events of the game, but apparently there are new mysterious threats to be discovered. I do want to play this game, so it probably might spoil it for me to read it, but I'm interested enough to just not care and go ahead and pick this up when it comes out. So I'm pumped for you, my Horizon Zero Dawn fans. Again, let's cut to a recreation of the fan response. Yeah! And now in just one piece of quickie news, I want to just go ahead and bat out of the way here. Apparently, Con Zealand and the Hugo Awards are moving online due to recent events, but definitely still occurring. So neat if you are excited for those. Now there is a rumor floating around online, and I really need to emphasize rumor. Please don't, uh, don't go shouting from the rooftops. Daniel confirmed true. That's not what this is. It's a rumor that Nintendo plans to re-release a large portion of Super Mario's back catalog to the Switch in 2020, as well as releasing a new Paper Mario game. I do think this rumor is quite likely though, because the sources for it have been accurate with similar stories before, and it's being echoed so strongly online. So, hey, if you're a Mario fan, Look forward to having this on your Switch, the availability of your nostalgic back catalog just opened way up. I mean, the Switch system already has like the most nostalgia appeal for a lot of us for several reasons. Now you can just directly tap into that vein, go straight to the source, I'm making it sound like drugs. I didn't mean to do that. It's not drugs. <laughs> now, before we continue on with the news, let's check in with Green Daniel and Westeros at the wall to give us the latest weather report. How is it over there, Green Daniel? It's cold. Great. Now, in back-to-back -back Ryan news, yes, that's a thing, Ryan Reynolds is reportedly in talks to produce and star in an adaptation of Dragon's Lair, a fantasy game that had a lot of success back in the 80s and briefly ran as an ABC TV show, surprisingly. I'm always down to watch Ryan Reynolds star in something and just bring his comedic talents to the forefront of it, so it's gonna be free on Netflix whenever it's released, so I'll probably be checking it out. Is there any old heads in my crowd that are just really pumped to see Dragon's Lair adapted? I've never played the game, so is there like a cohesive enough narrative to base it off of, or is this more just like taking a title and putting it on your thing to have a bit of franchise nostalgia help propel its success? I wouldn't know, because I haven't played, so let me know in the comments down below. And in that tantalizing, mysterious second piece of Ryan news, we're sticking with this segment here, Ryan Gosling is going to star in Project Hail Mary, a yet-to-be-released Andy Weir sci-fi novel. It is a bit ambitious to see a novel that hasn't even been released yet have its adaptation rights be bought up by MGN, let alone then already attaching Ryan Gosling's name to it. Hi. And he had his mega successful adaptation of his book The Martian with Matt Damon attached, so I guess they're just going to go ahead and try and recreate that here. If you haven't checked out The Martian book or movie, I recommend you do so. And I'm an Andy Weir fan, so I have nothing against this, though I I will read the book before I judge whether or not I need to see this movie because I have no idea what I'm getting into here yet. Oh, and notably, this is the second time Ryan Gosling will be playing an astronaut in his career, so that's kind of fun. Good for you, Ryan, and your and your space adventures. And in additional renewal news, we have also had it confirmed that Castlevania Season 4 will be coming to Netflix. Here is a recreation yet again of the fans' reactions. Yay! Now in a very funny piece of fantasy news today that I think I might be the only person on the planet who finds funny. Hot Toys has officially released images of the life-sized Baby Yoda toy available for purchase. I didn't even expect to cover this because I thought it was a nothing burger. I don't typically cover toy releases, but then I saw the Baby Yoda's face and he looks like he's extraordinarily uncomfortable to me. Am I the only one who sees it like this? He looks he looks like he's making that Tina noise. He's going like, eh. Baby Yoda makes so many cute expressions throughout the show. Why did you go with one where he looks so disconcerted? Look at look at this second image. He looks even more uncomfortable. I, what the world? I'm sure this will be one of the best selling toys of all time. I'm not exaggerating. This will be up there with the Tickle Me Elmos of toy history. But the biggest takeaway for me is just and let's just go ahead and get one other quick piece of Star Wars news out of the way. Apparently, Michael Bine and Bill Burr will be in season two. Michael Bine for the first time and Bill Burr returning. I hope they give Bill Burr some more like funny scenes. I don't know. The guy is a great comedian and I've seen him act seriously, but I've yet to see him take on like a comedic role. And that'd be interesting. Maybe he's not down for it. Maybe he likes more serious acting. That's fine. Great choice for him. He was really enjoyable in season one. So I'm just happy to see him returning for season two, but let's see if he can bring some of those comedy chops to his performance. That'd be a nice little experiment. And of course this comes on the tail of the news that Ahsoka will be in season two. Now in what? news. Reportedly, Anya Taylor-Joy has been in talks to star in a 
Furiosa prequel to Mad Max Fury Road. I like her casting for that idea. I like Anya Taylor-Joy quite a bit. I'm more just confused on why go back for Mad Max Fury Road instead of continuing the story of Furiosa forward. I liked Mad Max Fury Road as an introduction to this character, and I thought it was all the information we needed. It really set her up well, and I really want to see that story progress forward. Where's she going to go next? How will she survive? Going backward just seems like a riskier step and could possibly damage the character. Certain characters, the more you know, the less appealing they are. And I'm not saying it'll be bad. I actually think it has quite the potential to be great, and George Miller did such a good job with Fury Road. I blame nobody for going ahead just assuming that this will also be really awesome. It's just a, a strange direction to go in. One I'm still curious in, I like the casting, I think this could be wonderful, but I'm more cautiously optimistic for this than I would just be for, A, Furiosa is getting her own Mad Max movie and here it is for Charlize Theron. That would just be a, a, a knockout home run out of the park. You know what I mean? So I'm still, yeah, cool, but why? And in less of but why news and more of Okay, I don't know why I'm labeling the news like that. That's obnoxious. I'm going to stop this instant. We had a trailer for Solar Opposites drop from the mind of Justin Rowland. Like Rick and Morty Interdimensional Cable, the show. Like it just, it's this alien family that have the exact same sense of humor as Rick and Morty, the same animation style. It's just a different setting for all those same ideas. You just don't have Rick and Morty. It's a new setup. I'm not against this. I just find it to be a all right, move. Rick and Morty season three wasn't the best Rick and Morty season. We're seeing a bit of problem with diminishing returns there. So I'm a bit concerned on seeing them do this whole other project when, in my mind, we need all the TLC for Rick and Morty we can manage. Maybe this will be in the same universe. There might be crossovers. I don't know. I'm not going to speculate on that. It was a moderately interesting trailer. Of course, link down there if you want to check it out. But I'm just not like thrilled to see Justin Rowland have a new show, which is strange because you'd think I would be. Him and Dan Harmon are both fantastic. Anyway, let me know your thoughts on this story or any of the ones I covered here today in the comments down below. What are you currently reading as well? I'd love to see what you guys are burning through while you're in your isolation. That's a strange sentence you wouldn't think would suddenly be normal. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace.